What do we have here? Do we have an old Carl built? Or do we got a new blue label? We don't have any labels on the front. But we know that this is an X-Force cabinet. So we play this dangerous game. It's called the game of what is it roulette? And without identifying anything from the outside, because we don't have a label. We do know it's an X4 something. It's an X600, which means it would be like a two by six or something. Woo! Shut up, Dusty. Let's, uh. open it up and see who manufactured what. Because I think when Arlen bought the company from Carl, they even left the label maker for him. That's the reason the font didn't change for a while. Either that or Arlen was working his way through all the old stock. Now we got DEIs in here. And we got heat sink that comes back to here. Hmm. Hmm. We got some smoked resist horrors. We got our never cool fans doing their job. Got some smoke resistors. And I wonder why. I think this is an Arlen production. Yeah. We got ourselves a pop pill here, but I bet you almost anything that that cap is bad. I almost bet you dollar to donut. So if we come zoom around and take a look for in here, we'll see that the magic 10 ohm smoke has been released out of the one transistor. Now, we've got DEI's 14.2Q. And then over here, we've got 2290's 14.1Q. And as we've discussed in many, 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 many YouTube videos, that unless I've got them on the shelf in a used pile, we have no crosses for this. That means it's going to be a complete replacement. So even if we've got that and they're no longer in production, so they're not available for replacement, these particular parts. So unless I happen to have, and what I think is interesting is, once again, if we, if we look over here, these pill pockets have obviously had transistors put in them at some point or another. Check it out. There has been thermal compound applied, and there were transistors there, but there's no solder marks to back it up, which is weird. Very weird. So, i got to go and look through the pile of used parts that I have. Because, like, these transistors here... Just because we've got one bad pill. And a guy wants to up convert this thing. He told me, he goes, I want to change it. I want it to be a straight eight. So it means delete the driver section, delete the variable potentiometer. Um, we, we can scooch by with this relay. I'll have to see if he's interested in replacing it, going to something a little bit bigger, something a little bit more, a little bit more manly, something like that we know that it's going to hold for him forever and ever and ever. But this will work for an 8-pill, for the minimum. Uh, let's see, I think I might have one of those transformers laying here and add some pill strips to it. I mean, it's nothing more than just adding a couple more things. And we'd have to add another power wire. we have to move this. Move the cat bank. Hey, where are you going, camera? Come back over here. Sorry, our boys and girls. It was drifting away on us. Let's see, where does it end up now? How do we get so out of whack? Let's try that. There we go. So, long and short, short and long, at least we got metal clads on the output transformers, which is good. We'd have to change our combiners. Um, unless I happen to have three 14.2Q lot number DEIs, um, that means we've got to put HGs in here, the 1608s and be grateful for the consistency of us being able to get one part constantly from China that will cross with everything else in the universe. Now, okay, let's 
not a lie to you switch. I was thinking for a second, but I didn't see the capacitor back here. I was thinking that maybe that this was a lie to you switch, telling you it's got sideband delay on it, which is a thing these days. I don't know what that's all about, but no bias. So let me go dig through the pile part or parts of piles and so if I change all these transistors out, right, because one bad transistor, I don't throw all the transistors away. I throw the bad one away and then I keep the other ones for future repairs like this situation. So hopefully, hopefully, we've got some 14 two Qs. We'll see. We'll see. See, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And as a repair shop, this gets really, 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 really frustrating. Okay, so now I'm on the hunt for 14.2Q. And what I'm talking about is this lot number right here. Is that 13.1Q? Well, every time they change the transistor design, it makes the last transistor design completely obsolete and the parts don't intermix. So every amp that's been built so far thus far to date, and I'm getting really tired of saying this, but it seems like nobody seems to understand what I'm talking about. It's getting lost on the herd and the masses. Um, <clears throat> when X-Force was building with this, this is a blue label box, by the way. Um, when X-Force was building with these parts, there was no part stability. He was literally throwing in there anything he could get out of China. So let's say he built 500 boxes with the 13 q Okay, we got 500 boxes out there floating around with 13 q in it. Well, they go to the next rev, next generation of transistors is slightly modified to make it a little bit better and a little bit more reliable. So the next lot of transistors he gets in is 132Q. So we build another 500 boxes with 132Q in it. And 133Q, none of these parts are interchangeable. So now we have 1500, just saying that there could have been a thousand of these produced for each one. I'm just using this as an example. So now we have 1,500 amplifiers out there in circulation that are floating around with non-interchangeable parts, okay? Now I'm just grabbing the extra transistors I have sitting on the shelf to make this example, okay? Let's imagine that there's 13, 4Q, 5Q, 6Q, 7Q, 8Q, 9Q, oh, well, now let's do 14 1Q. So we've had nine different generations of this transistor hit the market and none of those parts are interchangeable with each other because they're slightly different. And the only person that knows the mystical guide to what these parts are, he's out of business. See, we started getting up towards the 15s and the 16s, and that's when they started going to the PP100s. And then there was also these parts being made underneath the PP name, okay, Power Pill. That was just a custom thing that got randomly slapped on top of the transistor that, you know, Arlen wanted to have put on there. So now let's say we got nine generations at 500 amps per generation of amplifier. Now we're going to go and we're going to do 14.1Q, 14.2Q, 14.2.0, 14.3Q. You start seeing the dilemma that's taking place here. There's too many revs of parts sharing the exact same part number, this 2879 part number. That's just to get to the 13s. Now let's go on over here. We've got 15.1Q through 15. 9Q plus 16 and now we've got 17 lots that are starting to show up. So as a part manufacturer or a part repair place, I'm not, I'm not manufacturing nothing, as being a repair joint, think about that for a hot minute. Slow down think about that for a hot minute. It's a game of Russian roulette. Now I don't know anybody that was buying hundreds and thousands of these parts that was thinking, hey, when they move on to the next generation, I'm gonna become the warehouse and supply all the replacement parts to support the life of these amplifiers. It's, it's no joke, okay? 
There are no crosses for these components, but they all share the same part number. And you go and you look up the data sheet for each one of these parts, they're a completely different thing. Well, they're all the same thing, it's just they've scrubbed the Toshiba name off of it, and they keep saying they work the same, but they don't, and they're not interchangeable. I mean, they might be. I might. I mean, I'm not going to try because it would be a waste of my time. I might be able to take the 16-2Q and run it with the 16-1C, or the 16-2T and the 16-1C. So how many different iterations of the same transistor were there produced? Now you understand the dilemma that we're in. So now that we just got done talking to each other about the transistor runs and what we got to do, let's actually talk about what this physical project is that this guy wants to have done. So we see this extra heat sink here and we go, oh, it's going to not be no big deal to slap another, another set of two transistors in here. Yes and no. This power wire is barely big enough to do the job. So this all needs to be changed, one. Two, I have to add another two power wires to make it so that there's enough current delivery, not only to just drive this, but to drive all eight of these transistors. This is 200 amps, this is another 30 over here. So I have to be able to easily and smoothly with the least amount of resistance as possible deliver 240 amps to the inside of this thing. Well, okay. So that means we have to do what they call a face, I, I call it a facelift. After the movie Face Off, I don't know if you guys remember that cinematic turd that was made back in the, the 90s with John Travolta and what's his face? <clears throat> balding on top dude um, that means I got to take all of this off the switches the combiner board or the splitter board the variable all this has got to come off all the ass end has got to come apart on the amp and the whole board's got to come out for me to change these wires now luckily on the back side we have a third grommet so we're gonna have two power wires per grommet hole Okay, we have a total of what, eight, not 10 transistors in here, six wires. I want to overkill it a little bit. I'd rather have a little bit of extra money and time in power wire than have it to where there's not enough current being able to get delivered to the distribution bus. So once we get that done, so that means we've got to eliminate these, drill a hole, remove, replace all the wire, and put this whole thing back together. Then the real fun starts, okay? Now I have two choices. The easy way, which is the way I'm considering doing, is we build the four port combiner over here. It's a three port, one, two, three. Build a four port and continue on and make it into a four, two pill section amp, which I've had luck with, they work great. Or we can do it more to the X-Force, Dave made style, Motorola suggested design. And I rewrap all the directions of the transformers and make it into two banks of two and take this and make it into a two pill combiner and turn this into a two pill splitter. It doesn't matter, it's roughly the same amount of work either way. For me, in my mind, the way I look at it. So. He did give the okay. He would like to upgrade his, his relay to something that's going to be a little bit more reliable. And then this is our tuning capacitor. This little disc capacitor, which is woefully inadequate for the KV that we're going to be putting past it. We need to remove this and we're going to go to a capacitance tube so we can dial it spot on. Um, this little hoopty job here, uh, depending on the style of combiner, if I go to a four port combiner, it needs to get replaced and go to a longer length because it means when you're going to have to compensate differently for the amount of inductor that's present in the combiner and uh, or if I go to a two port this needs to get to be a little bit shorter so this also gets to get replaced so I think I'm going to tear it down I'm going to do the power wire and then I will check back in with you so, so we're going to do the power wire then we're going to strip transistors, remount, put down our extended pill strips. And I really want to make this into a single stage. The, the less amount of stages of splitting 
and combining that you have, the less loss that you have. So doing the subcombiners where that comes in really handy, and then if we do that, I gotta replace this cap, this cap, and this cap. So it comes up, so we have a higher KV. Because these caps are always failing. They get hot, they break down, and let's look at the KV rating that they are. They're teeny tiny. This is a joke, by the way. Those are 500 volt caps. When commonly what we'd want to see in that position would be something like this. I mean, commonly we'd want to see at least a 3 kV cap in that position. And these are even prone to failure, these here. This would be a minimum, this cap here. But he says it's been working good for years and he's just been taking it easy on it. So if it's gonna come through here and come through this, this little facility for repair, I'm gonna put as much energy and effort as it as I possibly can and replace it with the best parts. Okay, let's talk. Let's actually get something done today. excuses on the bowl. Okay, so we've obviously done our power wire upgrade. I'm going to do the relay upgrade inside the case. We've been up-pilled now, so now it's a 2x8. Um, this is an old X-Force transformer I had sitting around. So we were able to transplant it, so I know everything's the same. Surface area of the transformer, material make, vintage, capacitors, all that crap's the same. Exactly the same. Now what we've done here on the back side is we pulled out all those little tiny piece of garbage capacitors and we've replaced them with silvers okay metal clad now we've got our new piece of coax run and I'm trying to make it so that I don't have to change out all these other three pieces of coax but if it's not perfect you know me I'm gonna do it so where we go from here is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna get this thing all fished back into the cabinet and um, get our switches all mounted back up and make sure all that's working but I'm gonna finish out this input combiner, or the input splitter, in the box, because I don't wanna have that extra one, this makes it a little bit more of a pain in the ass, but I don't wanna have any extra solder mess here on the board than I absolutely have to. So until I know my exact placement and where this is gonna sit inside the cabinet versus the holes that are already in the cabinet for placement of this board, it won't get this tied in. So we're real close. Now, our little wire pattern here looks a little jinky. And I normally like to make them all perfectly spaced. But what I'm shooting for here is when I do the power wire upgrades to each one of the transistors, I want it to land right next to one of these power wires in some fashion. So that way we're all getting the same amount of current to each one of the pill, pill uh, sections, two pill sections. I decided to go with the uh, four port combiner I want to see if I can make it work. I'm no, I know for a fact we're not going to have a problem. I've done this before. So we're getting close. We got the power wires to drop in on this thing yet. The majority of the work is actually done, believe it or not. So get the power wires dropped in on this, uh, change out the relay, put our inductor coil in place, change relay inductor coil, output tuning capacitor, um, get the input put it back together, and I think we'll be ready to run. So on to the next bit. So, you know the fun part about being me? Is I got nothing to lose, right? Like, who cares? No big deal. And I gotta tell you, this shit, it no work with HGs. I done it with Toshiba's and had no problems with it whatsoever. But these HGs, they weren't having it. Um, I spent most of my day chasing my tail, trying to figure out how I could get this thing to stop oscillating. I'd key it, and over here on the amp meter, it'd key up and then it'd show me I was pulling 170 something amps. And I was making no power. I'd unkey it and it dropped 125 amps. And I was sitting there trying to cook itself to death. I mean, it was weird. I would take 
uh, my output inductor coil and I literally took a jumper and went from here to the case and the input coil went from here to the case and it just it all it wanted to do was oscillate I could never get this inductor short enough nor could I get the input splitter inductor short enough to make it to where it didn't want to run around in a circle so what I discovered was about 25 different ways on how not to do this honestly to be the put it the best way I know how to put it um, a lot of my knowledge that I have when it comes to the good old amplifiers out here is from trial and failure and trial and failure I have done this before I actually went back and I looked at my notes I did this back in 2016 on a uh, Toshiba based amplifier and it worked flawlessly and to my knowledge that amp is still out there running so it's kind of hard to say. Is it something to, a little bit different about the transistors? Could be. Could be something a little bit different about the ferrite mix. It could be that. Or it could be that I'm just a, a jack wagon retard. Who knows? All I know is that this four port combiner setup, too much inductance, and it I could drop out three ports. I could have three ports connected and the fourth one disconnected and it wouldn't do it. And that was the only thing that would stop it from not oscillating. I changed the windings in the four port. I believe me, I went down the list of different things to try. When I come in and I run into a problem like this, I'm like a, a dog chasing its tail. It's like, ooh, something new. And I run 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 at it until I figure out what the heck. It, it never it never fell into one piece to where it was running smoothly and cleanly. Finally got it to quit oscillating, but it was producing massive amounts of harmonics. Like, embarrassing amount. So we decided that we'd pull back on those reins a little bit and we go to a little bit more conservative uh, one to two, one to two, one to two, two to one, two to one, two to one. And everything runs flawlessly. Our harmonics fell out of the box. Um, the main thing that you got to remember to do on this style of input splitter, and this is truly dictated just by looking at the spectrum analyzer, is you want to take the, uh, <clears throat> on a standard Toshiba build, this would be a 270, and we're going to drop this down to a 180, and it smooths right out. So we got our standard 150s back here, and I removed all the metal clads, and I actually did it, I mean, this took a little bit of work on my part so this didn't look like a roached out cockroach on the inside with solder splash every gosh darn where and everybody going oh that looks like garbage because me personally I don't like to have solder splash all over on the inside of the board so we've got this spot this spot and this spot and that one right there that don't have something physically attached to them on the input side the same thing as well like I've got a spot here and one here and one here that's it everything else got utilized which took a little bit of work uh, it was a little bit of thinking on my part but this thing runs just like a Swiss watch now heat up it unkeys so we're gonna take a look at the top left hand corner of the screen to you guys here heat up pull some amps unkey it heat up pull some amps unkey it now we're 14.5 volts, gentlemen and kind ladies. Let's go over here. Let's take a quick look here. That is a 1,000 watt slug in 2X. Let me do it like this. Take the lid. Let's put the lid down on the project here. Since we're done looking at the beautiful artwork we got going on. 1,000 in average and 5 watt slug in reverse back in the bird 10,000 watt dummy load here we got our 5 watt slug sitting between uh, the 2950 and our now 2x8 which is upscale from the 2x6 okay so first off let's zip over here and we'll show you pass through otherwise input drive power turn the amp to the off position hello audio that's what 20 watts looks like 20 25 watts looks like going in passing through and on a 2x scale at 012 let's go look at our pass through tune at 012 absolutely no resistance to the rf and the frequency that we're trying to pass through it 
We've got our variable cranked all the way open. Oh, 18, 1900 watts of power, no problem. Our input tune. Hello, 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 hello. Looks remarkably like our pass through tune. Imagined that. So, in all fairness, let's go over here. To be fair, as I say in Letterkenny, our preamp is working, all our lights are working. And let's do this last little bit of check. Let me grab a couple case screws here. We'll get a good ground going to the fan. Because remember, this is only the first half. Now, believe me when I tell you, I spent most of my day twiddly farting around with this stupid thing because I was damn determined to make that four quarter work and it didn't. So it's like what I teach these new guys when they show up, man, how do I do what you do? Uh, just be as transparent as possible. And if you screw up, embrace it. I screwed up, learned a bunch of new shit. It's kind of cool. Hello. Hello. One, two, one, two. What we're demonstrating to you now is that the fans aren't slowing down. We're not having any problems with them. It seems like the scourge of my existence here lately has been fans. It's Saturday. I'm closed. And it's 7 o'clock at night. Stop, guys. It's okay. Monday through Friday, please. But I'll respond to them anyhow because I'm a nice person. We're demonstrating that the RF isn't getting into the fans. All four of the fans are turning. We've got good airflow. So... The second part of this thing is now the matching power supply he purchased at the same time. He wants me to verify that everything in it is working perfectly. So we're going to grab the power supply. We're going to put it up here on the bench. We're going to attach the amplifier to that power supply. But first, we got to open up the power supply and we got to check all the modules in that 240 amp or 230 amp power supply. Away we go. As I. Um, I get rid of this twist lock RV plug. It's like literally the only 220 plug I don't have on my, my gang box over here for 220 outlets. I'm gonna rob the uh, rob off another plug here and stick it on, just so we can do the uh, do the test on this thing. Um, these projects take a lot of time. I started this on Thursday, this particular project. I want you guys to have a concept of how long some of this stuff takes and why it takes so stinking long to get done. Uh, Thursday was a nightmare. Um, by end of day Thursday, I was probably ready to physically shoot somebody. The phone never stopped ringing Thursday at all. And uh, I ended up getting called into my other job. And it, it's, it's a lot to answer everybody's phone call, everybody's YouTube message. You know, the haters say what they want. The reason I got the comments off on most of these videos is because I cannot take the time to reply to all the comments. I'm just, for these things to happen, for these videos to happen, I have to physically be able to do work. And every minute I spend touching my phone, I'm not doing this. It's Thursday, I swear, one of my biggest customers called me on Thursday and he had a concern about something that was going on with his box and I just about ripped his flipping head off. Because I was like, dude, stop hyper micro worrying about it was the end of the day. He goes, man, have you had a bad day? I said, dude, this day has sucked because I'm getting frustrated. I can't get nothing done. And Friday rolls around. It's a repeat of Thursday. And so here is Saturday, technically a day of rest. You know, I had 22 phone calls today. I didn't return not one of them. I, I just, I just don't have it in me. I got to take a minute and get stuff done in the same breath. You know, I want to go watch my kid that's only going to be a little kid for five minutes longer, literally. Go ride her horse. And it's, it's, an, it's an unbelievable balance. I know the rest of you guys, oh, I, 
Uh, I'm adulting too. What's your point there, BBI? That's... It's a lot. It's a lot. And by the end of the day, like Thursday, I had nothing. I couldn't come stand out here and do this anymore. I couldn't. I just... Yesterday was the same way. So today, to be able to sit here and not feel pressured by any other customers on why is it taking so long to get my amp done or why haven't you gotten this completed yet? I didn't get burdened with any of those things today. I felt free today to sit here and create and play. And literally what I did was play today. I mean, the circuit didn't work the way I thought it would. And for me to explore every single possible variable to that circuit and play with it is me teaching myself something. At least that's what I, I learned from college and higher schools outside of high school was how to learn a little bit. God knows I'm not the brightest guy in the room, but I'm telling you, it, I'm frustrated. Here it is Saturday, it's nine o'clock at night. Wife wanted to watch a movie and spend some time with me, just me and her. Took time for that, but in the same breath, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I gotta get this done. I gotta get this done. It says every man that's ever had a deadline or a timeline or something that they've had to work within. And most of the time, these are self imposed, these timelines and these deadlines. I just appreciate everybody's patience and working with me in every state. Oh look, I'm so weak I can't even ah, break a destructive seal. There we go. Oh shit. Oh, this isn't going to be quick. All right. This will be our amp module. It's our volt sense lead. Um, so let's see. There's four wires coming in this and four wires going out. So that means we've got these three tied together, these three, these four. This is our control leads, okay? They all need a different ground variable reference here. That's how this runs, at least on this modification, because I can see the wires just come in here and they they terminate right down there by that variable potentiometer that controls the voltage. So that means they've gone in there, they've cut that resistor, and they're using this based resistance on the front to control the voltage. So, yeah, this won't be too bad. See, what we've seen happen as X-Force progressed away from the Carl built days. This heavy kind of stuff got did away with uh, decent good eyelets. Um, down in here they've got heavy duty power wire going to two different common buses that are down on the inside and here in the bottom. You can just barely see them around this chicken poo here. But So all these wires have to be the same length. Um, if you've never seen the inside of this thing, you would have no clue. Lots of fans. I'll say that, lots of fans. So this one's chained to, okay, so it is these three modules that are tied together, one, two, and three. Then he's got the other leg, one, two, three, then one, two, no, one, two, one, two, three here, 
one, two, three here. So it's one, two, three, and then one, two. Okay. Got decent sized power wire coming off of everything going down to a common bus. So other than this being fairly cluttered, this isn't that big of a deal. But then there's always some shit like this going on. I mean, this has been running for a long time, right? So we're not going to freak out about this, but... Let's see if we can get that to come out of here in one piece. I mean, that could be bad if that decided to float around inside the power supply. But it didn't. It's been in there for a long time, so we're just going to throw that right into the effort bucket. We're going to move on with our lives. The ground bolt, they've got terminated to the case internally, and then they got a big piece of four gauge that comes down and goes right to the bottom four of the cabinet. For what reason? I don't know. I'll show you what I mean. You see that big piece of four gauge coming off that nut? It literally runs right down to the cabinet, and there's nothing else attached to it. So, we have the metal mass at the body of the cabinet with an eyelet attached to the back of it going back down to the metal mass of the cabinet on the floor. <sighs> okay. This only takes just a minute to do. Um, we're going to check to make sure each one of these supplies is working um, because they share a common load on the output and a common uh, output power share. There's no way to check to make sure each one of these modules is working without individually pulling the power off of them and metering them. So <laughs> it'll take just a minute. Let me get that done. Um, I'll throw some zip ties on this to stabilize this. Like I'll probably stabilize this to this power supply here. It'll keep this from wiggling in transport. I'll probably zip tie this back this direction. We'll clean this up a little bit. But this, I mean, See, so yeah, it's got big hunks of ferrite on it. See so yeah, that? Let's get down. Oh man, I wish I had a smaller camera sometimes. Um, we gotta isolate this and make it so it's not floating around. A bunch of little stuff, no big deal. Let me test this real quick, we'll be right back. Oh, but when we first turned it on, it would only go to 13. Hmm. Let's give it a second. Maybe it's trying to make up its mind what it wants to do. Oh, 14.5. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, it's no good. See, that's why we wanted to immobilize that wire. Oh, boy, that could be dangerous. Woohoohoohoo! Um, okay. Hey, she's right, wiggling. This is what controls our reference, and you can feel that resistor is broken in there. 
Hence the reason why I said it was really important to immobilize it. So let's, uh, let's autopsy this thing and see if we can figure out what's going on in there and get voltage where it's stable. Okay. So we're not going to let you be able to adjust it down to uh, nine and a half volts anymore. I think that's what created your problem, if I'm not mistaken, from the word go. Uh, we're at 14.24 here. Down here on this gauge it says 14.1. Nice smooth translation. We get you right up to the edge of sin, but not so much you're going to get yourself in trouble. And down here it says 15.9, and up here it's 15.97. So all the modules are working. There's 10 of them. So 10 modules at roughly 30 amps a module, full chooch. Is around 300 amps. We'll see if it can hold it or not. Um, conservatively speaking, conservatively, we know these modules are really actually good for about 200 amp, 220 amp a piece. So it's going to be right around that number right there, 240, 230 amps somewhere there. But now we've got smooth power. From woe to woohoo, and it's stable. So let's see how it handles the load. And we're not going to just go strap the amp onto it yet. Hold on one more time. We got one more test. One more test. Carbon load cell. There. There's 230 amp, 240 amp, we're sitting at 12.5 volts down here, 260, 280 displayed here, 276 here. So this will stay above 12.5 volts up to about 175 maybe 200 amp told you conservatively about 20 amps 25 amps a piece there's all oh, the 30 amps no they're not there no they're not but i think our main problem all the modules are working the main problem was this knob on the front and allowing you to get your voltage too low get you down there in a danger zone and it was like i was telling you on the phone you really want to run the thing around 15 volts because after you make it through all the connections and everything down to the transistors, underneath operation, the transistors are only going <laughs> only to see about, oh, what? Maybe 14, 14 and a half on a good day. So let's put all the pieces of the puzzle together now. Now that we've got everything tested and relatively confidently sure nothing's going to catch on fire no one's going to die no one's going to cry life will go on Lord only knows that this amplifier has spent enough time on a workbench to earn a sticker okay we got the thing cranked at max and uh, got this cranked at max. I'm running this with the 2950 as before. And our little amp gauge. Oh, one, 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 one. Let's go over here. It's a thousand watt Sogan 2X. Oh, one, 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 one. Oh, one, one, one. One one at oh. It's doing exactly as it should. One 
one one hello one 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 hello one 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 stand right around 15 volts I strongly suggest you run it somewhere between 15.9 And 15, right about, uh, your little set marks can be right about 15 volts, which in under operation will make it drop to about 14. One, one, hello, one, one, hello, one, 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 hello. Is what it is. Well, brother, your 2x6 is now a 2x8. Um, and this has been an interesting experience, to say the least. Hey, focus. Focus. There we go. It's been an interesting experience, to say the least. Learned quite a little bit about um, trying to use a four-port combiner circuit in here with the HG 1608s. That was uh, a good way to spend my afternoon. On that note, gentlemen, I'm going to run away. This thing came in here not working and is now left here working, and you guys have a little bit more knowledge. Uh, the most interesting bit of this whole thing to me was the transistor story. There are hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of amplifiers out there running around with non-replaceable components that aren't interchangeable, and there's no stock of those transistors anywhere. So is what it is. It's a situation which we created ourselves, so now we just have to live within it. When we don't hold the amp builder standards to a high enough level, um, some chicken shit shit like that happens and there's nothing we can do about it. It's happened. People bought the boxes because the prices were cheap and now they're out there floating around and people want to get them fixed. So we've got to go down these roads like what we did here today. But I do have a feeling that the 16 DO8s can be around for a hot minute. I hope. I hope they keep manufacturing that. But for the time being, it is what we have. I'm going to run, guys. This has been a long couple days, and tomorrow i got a road trip because i got to go meet a guy to go pick up some more equipment and more parts and more stuff. So on that note, appreciate you all tuning in and follow along. And uh, as always... If it's your first time watching, you might want to consider clicking subscribe and clicking that notification button. And if you're a repeat offender, I, I say thank you and welcome back. Big shout out to Siglent. Big shout out to Excess Power. Bird and Coaxial Dynamics, and I say thanks to all of you. Gentlemen, my name is BBI. I'll see you. Bye.